Welcome to Discovering. Tonight, we're looking for 450 million year old treasure in the form of fossils, give or take a few years. The UP is very well known for its copper and iron and lumber industry, but very few people know that you've actually got a lot of fossils here. And we'll take a look at the efforts being made by the Beatty Knock Great Lakes sport fishermen to help restore walleye populations in Little Beatty Knock. Sit back and relax. It's Monday night and time for Upper Michigan's very own Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. Black Bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure. Feelings that I have for this fine land There is so much to discover When you're a long-time lover Of northern Michigan some million years before dinosaurs came into existence, what is now the Upper Peninsula was situated somewhere south of the equator, under a shallow sea. And life existed, not on land, but only in those shallow seas. A half a billion years later, evidence of this life is all around us, if you know where to look. I met up with fossil hunter Roy Weber and paleontologist Joe Cahodal to do some fossil hunting in Delta County. Hey, I'm Paleo Joe, uh, Michigan paleontologist, and uh, I'm up here in the UP again. Uh, last time I was up here was two or three years ago looking for fossils. And you know, the UP is very well known for its copper and iron and lumber industry, but very few people know that you've actually got a lot of fossils here. Fossils that were here over 400 million years ago. Fossils, creatures that lived and thrived in what used to be an ancient tropical ocean here over top of the UP. I went to the Stonington Peninsula yesterday and a really great location up there. There's a roadside where you can stop and pick up a lot of fossils. There's also a quarry, the Delta County Road Commission quarry. You got to get permission to get in there. You can't just walk in. But we went in there uh, yesterday and found some really great things. Now what's really interesting is during the Ordovician period we were at the bottom of an ancient tropical ocean. And what happens when you're on the bottom of an ocean, it was a shallow sea, uh, you get a lot of depressions that form uh, because of the wave action. As the water travels towards the shore, it creates uh, depressions in, in the sandy bottom. And what happens is creatures that die or creatures kind of get stuck in those uh, depressions and then sand and sediment kind of covers up those, those creatures and they die. They start to become fossils. Well, we found something like that here. This is a depression that was formed as the water kind of came across towards the shore. And inside that depression, right there, we've got lots of little tiny seashells. Those shells are called lingula. And again, this is the depression. And as the sand kind of came in and filled in that depression, it created the rock on top of it. So what you're looking for in the Stonington Peninsula is these round, uh, round chunks of rock. When you find that, you chip up underneath it and you flip it over. And sure enough, there's the depression and there are the seashells right in the middle right there. So what normally happens is these creatures will die, and a lot of the creatures back then were called arthropods. They had a, a hard exoskeleton, a skeleton on the outside, kind of like lobsters, crabs, and what you got you know, crawling around out here, crayfish. And what happens is when they die, those pieces kind of fall apart. And those are the pieces that get washed into these deep depressions. And I found one of those creatures. There's actually a lot of rare creatures that are being studied by science right now. Um, they are kind of like Eurypterids. A uh, Eurypterid is a, what they call a sea scorpion. And uh, again, what you're going to find is bits and pieces. This again was a depression. And you can see how I pulled that off of there. This is one of the segments right there of one of those sea scorpions. So again, what happens is the scorpions will molt. They'll shed their exoskeleton. As they want to grow, they have to get rid of that exoskeleton. A lot of times you'll see those by a riverbank or by a stream bed. You'll see a bunch of those exoskeletons. Well, that's what this is. This is a piece of that exoskeleton that washed into one of those depressions. You break out the depression and sure enough, you've got an example of, of that creature right there. 
So a lot of stuff is happening up at the Stonington Peninsula. You've got these uh, limestone blocks that have got these depressions in it, but also there's a road cut there. And the road cut has lots and lots of fossils as well. Uh, a lot of brachiopods, a lot of seashells that are much, much larger than what you saw here. So again, we were once the bottom of a tropical ocean, uh, full of life, uh, seashells, corals, uh, crinoids. We're going to show a crinoid in a little bit. Um, all kinds of creatures live in those bottom, bottom of those tropical seas. One really great creature that's kind of rare and is really nice up here is called an isotelus trial, but we're going to talk about that in just a minute. I first met Joe in uh, 2017 down in Alpena. He hosts fossil digs down there. So I went down on a fossil dig, I believe it was in August. And I talked to the gentleman there and uh, I, I see that, you know, he's with his passion of fossils and he's very helpful. He helped me out in the field in the quarry getting fossils. So I talked to him after our dig and I said, hey, um, you can come up to the UP here. We have lots of fossils and also a very good nature program called Discovering. So he was very enthusiastic about the idea. And of course, you remember he was on in 2018. Now we're doing the show here in 2020, and I'm glad he's able to come up here again and do another Discovering episode. One of the other creatures that was in the ancient tropical oceans is something called a crinoid. People call those things sea lilies or lilies of the sea. They're not really flowers, they're animals. They're animals related to the modern day starfish. And the seas were full of those creatures. They grew on a really tall stalk. The stalk was made up of a lot of round discs that we call crinoid discs. When you get a bunch of those discs together, it's called a column. Now, a lot of people think that the Native Americans would take those little round discs that had a hole in them, they'd string sinew through them and use them as necklaces or bracelets. A lot of people today do the same thing. They find those little round discs and make necklaces out of them. At the top of the column was a ball. We call that ball a calyx. On top of the calyx, there were feathered fingers. And this thing was an animal. What it did is it used those feathered fingers to grab their food. Again, that plankton, those small particles of food, grab that food and bring it down inside the calyx, inside the crown where the mouth was. Now, unfortunately, we've not found a lot of complete crowns here in Michigan. I find some calyxes, some of those balls down in um, the lower peninsula around Alpena, Rogers City, over towards Traverse City. I've not found a complete uh, crinoid with the crown and stem attached, but I have brought one with me that was found uh, down in, uh, uh, down in uh, Indiana. This is a crinoid. What you see here is this is the, the stem right there. The stem is made up of a lot of those little round discs. Here at the bottom, that's just a piece of coral that this thing would attach itself to on the bottom of the ocean. Right here, this is what we call the calyx. This is the ball that kind of held those beautiful feathered fingers. All those little tiny lines right there, those are the pinules, and that's where it would grab the food so it could then bring it down inside the mouth up here. This again at the top, that's just another piece of coral. A lot of times what would happen is these things are preserved like this when there's a giant storm. When a hurricane comes across the ocean, it doesn't just stay on top of the ocean, it goes in the ocean as well and it churns up the water. But then it doesn't just stay in the water, it hits the land. We know it hits the land because there's a lot of damage down there. What it does, it picks up dirt and sand and sediment and mud and clay, washes it back out into those shallow lagoons where these creatures would live. So as the storm comes across, it knocks them over. And then as the mud comes off the land, it buries those creatures. That's preserving these wonderful creatures in the detail that, as they were when they were alive. A lot of times when we find these things, we just find the little tiny disks kind of scattered everywhere. Sometimes you'll find a complete stem that looks like this. Rarely do you find the calyx or those feathered fingers. I'm up here in the UP right now, just north of Escanaba. We're around Boney Falls, and there's something really cool here. We just came into a location where we find lots and lots of wonderful things. If you kind of look down here, this is a giant rock, a piece of limestone. Right next to my giant chisel here, you see this? Right there, that is a very large crinoid column. But it doesn't just stop there. I mean, if it stopped there, that'd be really kind of kind of cool. But look at this. There's a piece missing here. But if you follow this around, if you look right there, there's some more of it. And there's more of it goes right in there. Then it gets buried by this rock, by the sediment. But if you look a little bit further over here, it comes out right there. This was a giant crinoid. If you can think how small this stem is right here and how big this calyx is and how big those arms are, this guy was huge. His calyx could have been the size of my fist. 
and those pinules would have been the size possibly of this chisel right here. That was a giant creature. And again, this thing was a filter feeder. It would fill the, filter the water as it passed by those feathered fingers. A wonderful discovery right here, just outside of Boney Falls, just by the river. And again, beautiful crinoid stem right there. Uh, wish I could find the calyx, wish I could find the ball. It could be somewhere in this rock. We're gonna check that out a little later on. Also in Stonington, I found this thing right here. Again, this is a part of the bottom of the ocean. And as I was chipping it away, I saw something there. And as I chipped more, this thing flipped over. And this is part of a creature. It's very similar to the Eurypterids. Uh, they're related to the modern day scorpion. They actually, they call these things sea scorpions. And this is a very rare creature found down in Stonington. Uh, there's several people doing research on these guys right now. Again, we know that they're kind of like the sea scorpions, but they're different. They had a hard external shell and um, they're just really exciting. I'm glad I found this piece right here. Hopefully do some more research on it. There's another creature that uh, inhabited the tropical oceans here in the UP millions of years ago. It's called a trilobite. Trilobites are unique creatures. Actually, kids learn about trilobites in school. Uh, trilobite is one of the first creatures on Earth that actually had eyes. They had very primitive eyes, kind of like a fly's eye. This guy right here, this is called an Isotelus maximus. This Isotelus maximus comes from a, an area around Cincinnati, Ohio got this central lobe right here. Then they've got two plural lobes, one on either side. That's why they call it trilobite. But it's also divided horizontally into three sections. It's got the head section right here. It's got two eyes on it. It's got the middle body section right here. It's got a tail section right here we call the pagidium. You've got lots of other trilobites that are found in this formation. You've got trilobites called the flexicalamini. You've got uh, a lot of different kind of bugs that were here back then. This is the piece I found yesterday. It's called a genal spine. This spine right here is that spine right there. This guy is four inches long. This guy is a monster. This guy would have been over a foot long. So you find a lot of bits and pieces out there in Stonington, and I'm sure somewhere in Stonington, there's gonna be a, a complete trial by that kind of looks like that. Also, while I was there at the lake shore, I found something quite unique. This is a shark's tooth. Back then, the sharks weren't kind of like they are today. Today, the sharks, they're made up of cartilage. Pretty, pretty much the only thing you find of a shark after it dies are the shark's teeth. The sharks we had back then, again, were quite small. Um, they really didn't have a lot of super sharp teeth like they have today. Sometimes they had teeth like that. They were really a, a wonderful find up in Stonington. When we go fossil hunting, we have a lot of different kinds of tools that we use. A lot of times we use what's called a geological hammer or a paleontological hammer. And the hammer basically has a pick end or a chisel end on the side. We use that to get in between the layers of the rock and kind of break it open. However, in limestone like this, this is really hard rock limestone, I use a little bit different hammer. I use a hand sledge. This is a two pound hand sledge. And I also have some steel chisels. And what we do is we try to find a crack in the rock. And when you find that crack in the rock, that's where you start with a chisel. And because it's limestone, it takes an awful lot of work. I'm trying to remove this chunk of crinoid and take her back home so I can look at it and study it. And there we go. Broke it open. And I, you know, who knows what's under, underneath this thing. It could be something really special. Unfortunately, there's nothing special under there right now. But what I did do is I got this chunk of crinoid off of here. And again, we saw this one earlier in the episode. There's the crinoid stem goes right down through there. Now I can take this home and I can work with my air chisel and my uh, little mini jackhammer and I can break apart a lot of this limestone to get to that, uh, get to that crinoid uh, that's inside there to see the rest of the stem. A lot of times limestone really protects the fossils very well. Uh, the shale doesn't as much because it breaks apart. It frags so very easily. These are chunks of, uh, of the shale and you can see it kind of falls apart in little tiny pieces. Uh, when you're trying to get fossils out of this, I mean, it just crumbles. You can see how it crumbles. Limestone's not like that. This is what I want to see. I want to see the crack forms all the way along the entire plane of that rock. What that is, it's called a bedding plane. And what happens is, as the sediment kind of washes into the shore, it lays down layer upon a layer of sand and mud and, and whatever else it's uh, laying down. And then that's kind of what we're looking for. When we can split that rock along a bedding plane, chances of something being inside there are much better than just whacking at a rock. And let's hope there's something in here. 
And unfortunately, just a bunch more sediment. There's nothing in here. And that's unfortunately what paleontology is. You just break a lot of rock and hopefully you find something, but chances are you're not going to find much. Unless you get into a layer that's really fossil rich, and then you just find a ton of stuff. At Stonington Peninsula, we find a lot of brachiopods. Brachiopods are seashells. Uh, they lived on the bottom of the ocean. Um, brachiopods have two unequal halves. One half of the shell is bigger than the other half. They're not like clams. When you think about a clam, the halves are just about pretty much equal. When you talk about brachiopods, the, sh the shells are completely different from one side to the other. This is an example of some of the brachiopods I found uh, at the peninsula yesterday. What we've got here is different species of brachiopods. The brachiopods lived on the bottom of the tropical oceans, and right here is where the hinge line is. So this creature actually sat on the bottom of the ocean like this, then it would open up these two halves of the shell like that. It was a filter feeder. What it did is it took the water as it kind of came by, and it would filter that water, grab the little microscopic particles, the plankton, and it would eat those. So again, these creatures would open and close just like they do in the oceans today. The hinge line is where they actually sat on the bottom of the ocean. They attached themselves to the bottom uh, by using a, kind of like a little muscular foot that they had. We call that a pedicle. And they would attach themselves to the bottom of the ocean, open up like this, and filter the water as it came through as it passed by. Very prolific, lots and lots of different species back then. Over 200,000 different species of shells lived in the ancient tropical oceans. And right here is an example of the bottom of the ocean. This is about 400 million years old. This is the bottom of the tropical ocean, close to the beach. And you see all those shells kind of fell in uh, and got trapped inside that mud. Then that mud slowly started to turn into stone and turned into this uh, bottom of the sea. We call this hash. Whenever you find a whole bunch of fossils all stuck together in one great big chunk, we call that hash. That's the bottom of the ocean 400 million years ago. Located off the shores of Delta County, Little Beatty Knot consists of 30,000 acres of water that was once dubbed the walleye capital of the world. Fishing Little Beatty Knock has changed throughout the years, in part due to the introduction of exotic species like zebra mussels. Hopefully, the bay is on its way to a comeback due to the efforts of the DNR as well as independent organizations like the Beatty Knot Great Lakes Sport Fishermen. Some of those efforts come in the form of raising and stocking walleyes. And if you're a walleye, you need to eat. And that means minnows. A lot of minnows. Minnows we're doing today are fathead minnows. Our idea here is with the uh, minnows to uh, raise minnows to feed our fall fingerlings and not have to buy them. Um, they're about 450 a pound from the uh, dealer. So our idea was to raise the minnows, trap the minnows, and feed our fall fingerlings. There's one on the bottom we got to tie to. All right, we're going to tie the nets to the shoreline of the tree. Dog food inside the nets Good. for food. Attract the minnows, and then we're going to pull them out tight and then we'll drop an anchor to keep them tight with a float on it. They sink to the bottom. Go ahead, drop. Yeah, they come into the net, they smell the food and they're gonna travel that net and come in. There's three sets of rooms in those traps, the trap nets. And by the time they get to the end, they should not be able to come back out. Um, some of the smaller ones that we'll find is like a half inch or smaller. They might come and go as they please. There's a lot of juvenile minnows in here. All right, drop it, don't. We tried some smaller nets. Uh, they just didn't work. We couldn't get enough uh, production out of smaller trap nets. Uh, the DNR and Darren Kramer gave us uh, these uh, fike nets, mini fike nets that we're using today. I've used them three or four times now and they produced about three or four thousand minnows each trip. So um, we put 14 out today. Hopefully we'll get uh, 20, 25, 30,000. So there was actually some fat heads in here already from the DNR when they they raised walleye in here like 2012, I think, or 2011. But we initially put 110 pounds of minnows in here last fall, last summer, August. So they got like three or four months of breeding last year. This spring, we put another 100 pounds in it for breeding. But there's about 240 fish per pound on these minnows, depending on the size, to, from, you know, the length of the minnow. <laughs> they, they produce every 28 days, these minnows do. Flea two to three thousand eggs per female and the males take care of the eggs and the females just go on and keep breeding um, the males have a have a big uh, flat spot on top of their head there's like a red rosy type of deal that where they use it to scrub the eggs off while they, they maintain them 
There you go. What we're doing is today is trapping the minnows. Tomorrow we'll pull them and then transport them down to oil tank pond to feed our fall fingerlings, which are coming out and uh, end of the month here, the 26th. In the upcoming weeks, we'll check back in with the Beatty Not Great Lakes sport fishermen as their efforts to help rejuvenate the bay continue. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next week right here on Upper Michigan's very own Discovering. <laughs>